Thanks, Jay, for having me, and thanks to ESI. And thank you all to, uh, for coming tonight. I'm really excited for the opportunity to talk to you about three of my favorite things, lemurs, friends, and of course, power. <laughs> so I am a biological anthropologist, and biological anthropology is the study of humans within the context of living things. And in particular, I'm a primatologist. That means that I focus my research on non-human primates, our closest relatives. Um, how many of you know what a primate is? Anybody can? I know you said don't say anything, but this is the one time you can talk. Who can name a primate for me? Names, call, call something out. Aye, aye. Aye, aye. Lemurs. Lemurs. Monkeys. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent, you guys know what primates are, wonderful. So um, primates are the lemurs, the lorises, they're tarsiers, they're monkeys, they're apes. These are our um, closest relatives. And as a primatologist, I'm interested in their evolutionary relationships. And the way we look at their evolutionary relationships, the way we show it is with a family tree like this. And so I'm going to walk you through how to read this family tree. The first thing you'll see here is that monkeys and apes are closely connected and they're linked. And that's because they are close relatives to each other and they share a common ancestor. Tarsiers share a common ancestor with the ancestors of monkeys and apes. Lemurs and lorises are closely related and they share a common ancestor. And then the last common ancestor of lemurs and lorises um, share a common ancestor with the last common ancestor of tarsiers, monkeys, and apes. And so this is the last common ancestor of all primates. And understanding this family tree is going to be important later in the talk. But it's important to know that humans <laughs> are also on this family tree, and we're most closely related to the apes. But I focus on lemurs. I'm interested in lemur behavior. And you might wonder, why in the world does someone in an anthropology department that's interested in humans, why does someone study in an anthropology department study lemurs? They seem very distantly related to us. But there's a very good reason to study lemurs, besides they're super interesting in and of themselves. But one of the reasons for studying them is because they have a very long, independent, evolutionary history separate from us. So they evolved, um, they separated from uh, the other primates millions and millions of years ago. And so lemurs are a great group of primates to test um, hypotheses about why humans have evolved the way they have. Great for testing uh, hypotheses about primate evolution. So lemurs, uh, this is a bunch of different kinds of lemurs. There's actually 103 different species of lemurs that are recognized today. And they come in a variety of shapes and sizes from this little tiny mouse lemur here, which is about this big. And this is a packet of sugar. And the tiniest primate in the world weighs about the same as six packets of sugar. So mouse lemurs are really tiny, but lemurs are also much larger. They can be... Um, the, uh, about the size of about 10, 15 pounds. But you guys probably recognize these guys. The ring-tailed lemurs are probably the most famous of the lemurs of, of all. But there's a lot of diversity in lemurs. Lemurs are found in Madagascar. And um, this is where Madagascar is. And it looks tiny there, but that's just because Africa is so huge. Oh, it's the wrong direction. Uh, here we go. Madagascar is actually the fourth largest island in the world. And if you move it over here onto the US, you can see that it's actually um, a little bit larger than the size of California. So it's a really large island, even though it looks small. And it's half, about halfway around the world from here in Austin. So if I want to go do my research on lemurs, the first thing I have to do is I have to hop on a plane and fly about three hours to Atlanta. And then I fly about 10 more hours to Paris, France. And then I fly on an 11-hour flight to Madagascar. And then you have, that's not even counting the time in the airports. And you guys know how it is in airports. So we'll add about 12 hours of just time sitting around in airports. 
and that's being very generous to the airlines. And then, so that can, then gets me to the capital of Madagascar, Antananarivo. So then I usually spend the night and get in the car, and I have to drive about 15 more hours to get to Morindav, which is um, the closest town to my research site. And then I uh, spend the night, buy a bunch of supplies, and I drive about four more hours to get to my site. But that's assuming that the roads are actually good condition. And this is Madagascar, and Madagascar is notorious for having terrible roads. So uh, sometimes I just cannot go by road, in which case, uh, because I have to drive through rivers and things like that, but if I can't go by road, then what I have to do is I have to take a boat on the Mozambique Channel for about three hours, and I get to Belu sur Mer, which is a fishing village nearby. And if I'm lucky, I can hire an ox cart or two to be able to take me and my stuff to the station. Um, this is Phelan, one of my graduate students. And if I'm not lucky, then I get to walk through the mud flats all the way to my site, in which case, it takes me about 61 hours just to get to my site before I can set up my tent to be able to even start thinking about doing my research. So um, it's quite a trek to get to Madagascar, but I, and it can be exhausting. But I have to say, this is one of my favorite parts. I love that one of the things about being a primatologist is I get to go on these adventures. Um, and I've been working in Madagascar for about 23 years. I've worked in rainforests, I've worked in the spiny desert, I've worked with large lemurs, I've worked with small lemurs, and uh, for the last uh, 10 years or so, I have been focusing mainly on Varro shifak, um, which is my main study species. And as Jay said, I set up um, a new field station in the Karindi Matei National Park called Ankua Shifaka. And actually that's the region of the forest is called Ankua Shifaka, which is really nice because it means the place where there are also Shifak. And so it, it's kind of nice that it already had that name. So I uh, set up this field station in 2006, 2007. And this is what it looks like. We have some buildings, not super fancy, but we have some buildings. We have um, solar power, so we have energy. Researchers sleep in a tent. I like to have a big one. <laughs> uh, we use a latrine. Uh, we eat beans and rice. It's pretty basic accommodations, but it's really, um, it has a, all the things that we need to be able to do the kinds of scientific research that we want to do in the forest. And um, I've cut 82 kilometers of trails into the forest. And so that we don't get lost, I put up these little street signs here so that we can navigate around the forest. I have 14,000 trees marked and identified. And then I have um, habituated 130 different shifak. And you have to habituate the lemurs to human presence, especially if you're interested in social behavior like I am, because you want to make sure that the animals are behaving in their normal way if you want to collect behavior on them behavioral data. So, and I, as I said, I'm interested in behavior, and shifak are very social. They live in groups of two to 14 animals, and they love to groom and play and things like that. They are arboreal. They live in the trees, and they eat leaves and buds and seeds. And one of the things that they really love to do is go try to get the, the leaves that are at the very tips of the branches. And so they have these wonderful adaptations for being able to feed on the terminal ends of branches. Um, they sleep in really big trees at night. This is a baobab tree here. I don't know if you can see, that's actually a little ball of lemurs right there. And um, I call it a sleep ball. It's not a technical term, but it looks just like a ball of lemurs. And they're huddled in the trees at night. And you might wonder, why in the world are they sleeping in this really tall tree? Well, that's because of these guys. This is a fusa. And a fusa is essentially a really big mongoose. And they love to eat lemurs. And so the, re the fusa are um, able to hunt in the trees. They're very um, agile in the trees. And so the shifak, if they want to sleep at night, where they don't have to worry about being eaten by a fusa who can climb in the trees, they need to sleep in something really tall like this, uh, because the fusa cannot climb these giant baobab trees. And in fact, no one can, not even the shifak. 
The way that the Shiva get to these trees is they have to jump from a neighboring tree into that tree. So it's a really safe place to be able to sleep at night. Uh, but you have to be a really good jumper to be able to make it into one of these trees. And Shifa are amazing jumpers. They have this form of locomotion called vertical clinging and leaping. So a lot of monkeys walk around on their, you know, like a cat or a dog, or you think about a squirrel in a tree on all fours. Well, the Shifa are vertical clingers and leapers. And what they do is they hold on to the tree, they push off, turn 180 degrees, and then land on the next tree. Or they just bounce off like a ball in a pinball machine and go right to the next tree. So they're these amazing jumpers. And to be able to do that, they have to have these really long, strong legs. And because they have these really long legs, when they come down to the ground, if they were to walk on all fours, their behind would be up in the air and their head would be down in the ground. So they can't walk like that. So they walk around on two legs, but they don't walk like you and me. They do this hopping motion along the ground. And I have some video for you. Um, they love to, this is, they love to use our trails. <laughs> and so they are super fast. It looks like, you know, they're these little tiny, they weigh about the size of a cat, and yet they can go faster than me down these trails. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shivag have uh, one infant every year or two, and they start having infants when the females are about five years of age. And a lot of my work has, or some of my work has been looking at things like how does food availability influence the ability of females to have infants and the survival of infants. But what I want to talk to you about is how this form of locomotion actually influences how they carry and nurse their infants. So what happens when a baby is born, the female starts carrying it in the nook of their, um, kind of in the thigh area here. And when the baby matures, um, after about uh, several weeks, the baby will move on to the back. This is a much older baby here, but they move on to the back. But um, um, when, uh, when you think about the way a human, like if a mother is um, wanting to walk around and carry her baby, or if um, a monkey is wanting to walk around and carry the baby, the, the mother can actually move around and carry their baby while it's nursing. But um, the Shifak have a problem in that they are vertical clingers and leapers. And most primates, the, um, the nipples of the female are on the chest, right, at the very front. And so um, this works out fine most of the time, but if you're a vertical clinger and leaper, think about what happens to the baby's head. If the mom is holding onto a branch, turns around, you know, jumps off the tree, and lands on another tree, what's going to happen to that baby's head? It's going to get smashed, right? Not really good if you want to um, increase your fitness, right? Moms don't really want to kill their babies while they're jumping around. At least they shouldn't. So you'll notice here, this is actually Augie here who's nursing on his mom, Anna. And you'll notice that Augie is actually, um, his face is in her armpits. And I think Shivak are a great example of natural selection. Because you can see how if a female has the nipples on the front of her chest and she uses vertical clinging uh, and leaping motion, locomotion, then it's not great for her fitness. But you can see how a female who had nipples that were a little bit farther to the side of her chest, her, her babies would be more likely to survive. And so over evolutionary time, over millions of years, the nipples have migrated to the um, armpits and babies are able to survive. So a great example of natural selection. So who here has seen the Madagascar movies? Yeah, have you seen all three of them? The third one's kind of crazy, but it's really good, right? I love the Madagascar movies, but they don't have any Shifak in them. Can you believe that? They made a whole movie and they didn't put, about lemurs and they didn't put any Shifak. But never, don't worry, Shifak had their um, time of fame and that they were in this movie by Disney called Dinosaur about 15 years ago. And uh, contrary to Disney, I hate to tell you, but the, the Shifak were not around during the Cretaceous period with the dinosaurs. <laughs> Um, 
And the other thing that Disney did with this movie is they set up the, the Shifak social group as a family group a male and a, a, a father and a mother and a kid and the father they made larger than the mother and he was the one who kind of uh, ran the show but that's actually not the way it is with Shivak. Here is a graph that shows you the weight for, uh, for Shivak um, for females and males. This circle here is the average weight for females and the average weight for males and the lines here are um, they're a statistical measure of variation called standard deviation. And so what you can see is that females are actually larger than the males. So Disney got that part wrong, right? And the other thing they got wrong is that females run the show in Shifak. Females are what's called, Shifak are what's called female dominant. And I'm going to give you a typical exam an example of a typical day for a male Shifak in, um, in the wild. So here's Rich, and he's eating a seed pod. These seed pods are kind of rare in the forest, so he's really excited about it. And Emily's hanging out nearby. Emily looks to see what he's eating and decides she really wants it. So what does she do? She hits him on the head, <laughs> and she takes it. And then she goes off and she eats it by herself. And I don't recommend doing that. And it's not very nice behavior, but that's, that's typical of Shifak societies. If females want something, they get it. So um, in some ways, Shifak are like Wonder Woman in that they have um, superpowers, or at least they're super jumpers like Wonder Woman. And uh, females have a lot of power. And given that when I was six years old, I wanted to be Wonder Woman, it's not surprising that, um, that I actually study female power in an animal that has amazing leaping abilities. So <laughs> anyway, before I tell you about some of my research on uh, Shifak, I want to start out by talking a little bit about the science of studying the lemurs. And so, um, the first thing we have to do if you want to study the behavior of wild lemurs is you have to find them because they're living in the forest and you have to figure out where they are. So we use something called radio telemetry. And so we put a, I put a radio collar on him. This is Isaac here and he's got a radio collar on. And then what we do is we use something, we use a receiver and an antenna and it picks up a signal that's being put off. Um, sent by the radio callers, and we're able to locate where they are in the forest. But to be able to put that radio collar on the lemur, I have to actually capture it first. And I don't capture the lemurs myself. What I do is I hire Anafa. Anafa is an amazing darter. He has darted lemurs with a blowpipe for about four decades. He's darted thousands and thousands of lemurs. He works with people, primatologists such as myself, all over the island. And so I hire him because he's just amazing. Remember those little mouse lemurs I told you about? They're about this big. He uses a blowgun to dart them at night. He is so incredible. And so I hire him instead of doing it myself. And what we do is I bring him in, and we're out there, and I'm like, okay, and off I want you to dart this lemur here. And so he just pulls out the blowpipe, shoots a dart. The dart lands right in the thigh or buttocks muscle, injects the anesthetic. The lemur gets a little bit woogly, and we run under immediately with a bed sheet and catch it when it falls out of the tree. And then that allows me to do things like put a radio collar on or stuff it in a basket so I can see how much it weighs. So, um, but while they're down and while they're sedated, I go ahead and take a lot of measurements and um, samples from them. Uh, you'll see here that um, you see some, ho some holes in the ears. One of the things that I do is I want to get a DNA sample. And so I take a little bit of ear tissue to get that DNA. It's like when you get your ears pierced. It's just a little punch. Um, and that allows me to, to um, be able to um, get some genetic material. But I'm actually, I've been collaborating with Tony DeFiori, who's in the audience here, um, one of the faculty at um, UT with me. And we've been um, collecting fecal samples, and we've figured out how to extract a DNA from the fecal samples. So pretty soon, I don't have to put holes in their ears anymore. What we're going to be able to do is uh, collect genetic samples non-invasively. 
Uh, but while, while they're down, some of them get a radio collar, but the other ones get a dog collar and tag so I can identify who they are easily. But we also do things like look and see how many ticks or lice or things like that that they have. And I collaborate with researchers like this is Feedy here, who's a wildlife veterinarian. And with Feedy, uh, we've been looking at uh, things like how many white, bl white blood cells do uh, normal, healthy shefog has? What is the normal weight, the heart rate? What is the, bl the blood pressure? What does a normal, healthy shefog look like? We don't know unless you collect a lot of data from wild animals to see what it's like. So I collaborate with Feedy on that sort of thing. But <clears throat> really, what I'm mostly interested in is understanding their behavior. And the way I collect the behavioral data is I spend a lot of time looking up in the trees. And um, so by the end of the field season, my neck is really strong. And we just write down in a systematic way what they do. And luckily, the shefak take a siesta midday. They're very civilized. And so um, that gives me a chance to sit down and get off my feet for a moment. But I don't actually rest. Um, in terms of stopping to work, this is the time during the siesta when I see some of the most interesting social behavior. Because this is when they're having little fights about who gets to cuddle with who, and they're grooming each other, and they're moving around and displacing each other. And so even though I get to sit down, I don't get to relax during the siesta. But I'm a professor here at UT, and so I have to teach, I don't have, I get to teach classes. <laughs> I get to get, teach classes um, in the fall and spring semester. And so I can't be there in Madagascar collecting data. But I need to have data year round to understand their social relationships. So I have a team of people who work with me on this project. I have local assistants. I have both US and Malagasy graduate students, as well as volunteers who are there day in and day out collecting the data. And sometimes I have to wonder who is actually observing whom. <laughs> so, but physiology influences behavior. And um, you may have noticed um, hormones influencing behavior, especially in certain times in your life when um, hormones are in fluctuations, such as when, you're a when you were a teen, you are or were a teenager, or during pregnancy. When hormones are changing, that's when we really notice how our mood and behavior is influenced by hormones. But it's influenced on a daily basis by these hormones. And so if you're interested in understanding how hormones influence behavior and you're studying humans, you can just go up to the person and say, excuse me, will you spit or pee in this cup here? Or can I get a little bit of blood from you right after you've been stressed so I can see what your hormones are like? But I can't go up to my lemurs and say, excuse me, will you spit in this cup for me? Or will you present your arm so I can get a little bit of blood? I can't do that. But what I can do is take advantage of the fact that they do urinate throughout the day, periodically. And I can try to collect it um, opportunistically. And so um, I just started collecting urine. And um, so I talked to a colleague of mine that I'm collaborating with. And I said, how do you collect the urine? Because she works with lemurs. And her lemurs are quadrupedal. And so they stand on the branch. And, and, and she says, I just run, stand underneath with a, with a frisbee. And I catch it when it comes down. And I thought, I can do that. That's not too hard, right? So. I went and I thought, okay, here's the lemur whose tail goes up. So I rushed underneath with my Frisbee. And this is what I got. I don't know if you can see, there are a few little drops of urine here. There's actually some pellets of poop as well. But mostly what happened is the urine went all over my face. <laughs> so, the reason I couldn't use this system is because they're vertical clingers and leapers. So when <laughs> When my lemurs urinate, it went up against the tree and splashed everywhere. And that's why it got all over me. So I don't use that method. I don't really like getting it all over my face. But so well, what I've done is I've developed a new system of collecting the urine. And instead, what I do is when I see that tail go up, I rush underneath them, 
put tin foil all around the bottom of the tree. You see why it's important to have animals habituated because I don't want to scare them during this time. So I run underneath, I put the tin foil around and hope that they don't switch trees before they, <laughs> before they pee. And I also hope that if they do, that it actually lands on the tin foil. But then once it does, I can use a pipette and collect it, put it in a vial, and then stick it in some liquid nitrogen to store it, to send it off for analysis. That's a lot of work to get a little sample. So luckily, some hormones you can actually get from fecal samples. So um, I also collect poop while I'm there. And so what I do is I collect the fecal sample, wrap it up in some tin foil in a little package, stick it in the oven at 175 degrees Fahrenheit for about uh, three hours, and then I can ship it off to the lab and find out things like dominant males have higher testosterone than subordinate males. So I'm interested in social relationships. And I, but I can't give my lemurs a survey or do some interviews and ask them, who are your friends? Who do you consider family? I can't ask those kinds of things. So if I want to know who are the friends, who are the family, I have to go around collecting these kinds of data and then try to piece together the puzzle of what their social relationships really are. And one of the things that fascinates me about social relationships is power. So when people talk about power in animals, they usually talk about who's biggest and baddest, the fighting ability. We even use terms like brute force, right? So when people think about power in non-humans, they tend to think about fighting ability. But power can be more than fighting ability because power arises whenever there's an inequality in a relationship. And that inequality, that social inequality, can arise because of an asymmetry in resources or coalition partners or knowledge. And um, mating, uh, sorry, mating opportunities and sex ratios can also be a source of power in relationships between males and females. And I'm interested in primate social relationships and primate, the power in primate societies. And so what I want to know is when is power based upon uh, force or the threat of force? And when is power based on more economic sources of power? When is it based on an asymmetry other than just fighting ability? When do animals have leverage? And also, I want to know, what is it good for? You have this power, what is it good for? And in human societies, people sometimes use power for fame and fortune, but the lemurs don't have money, so they're not going for fame and fortune. But the currency of biology is fitness. And so what I want, what I want to look for is and see, do individuals uh, who have more power, do they have higher fitness? Do they pass on their genes to the next generation more than other individuals? So I can look at questions like, who has babies? Do those individuals who have babies, do they survive? And do, the babies of, um, the, do those babies grow up and have babies of their own? That gives me information about fitness. But I also can look and see who wins conflicts, who gets the food, because that's going to increase. If you get food, that's really important for producing these babies. And then I can look at things like, do winners of conflicts actually have more babies? So if you want to see a conflict in Shifak, the best place to do it is in a baobab tree. And I don't know how much you know about baobabs, but here's a baobab fruit. And um, the, the shifog really want to get at these seeds here in the fruit. And the seeds are full of fat. They're really fatty. And it's so, the seeds are so fat that you can actually go on Amazon and buy baobab oil um, in the health or beauty supply section because there's so much fat. And so the, it's a really great source of nutrition for the, the lemurs. But the problem is that there's this really thick 
big hard shell that the fruit has to protect those seeds because they don't want the lemurs eating them. And so sheep hog have to spend a lot of time. It's really hard to break through those, that shell. And most of the time they're not successful. They'll spend a lot of time just trying and trying and trying to break through with their teeth. And then these are some of the fruits that they just drop down on the ground because they couldn't get through that hard shell. And dominant animals are pretty cheeky. And what they like to do is they like to wait till somebody gets one open, they break through the hard shell, and then the dominant individual comes along and takes it, says, thank you very much. And they don't have to spend the energy um, trying to break through. And so here's an example. Here you have Zipper, who's working really hard on that baobab fruit. And you got Savannah just hanging out down here waiting. And so once Zipper finally breaks through that hard shell, Savannah comes along and takes it away. So that's what it's like in a she fox society. <laughs> Not always fair. But so I can look at questions like, do individuals who win these conflicts, do they have more babies and do their infants survive? In other words, does winning translate into higher fitness? And so this figure shows infant survival for dominant females subordinate females, and females who are the only adult female in their social group. And you'll see that winning doesn't, you know, if you're a dominant individual and you win your conflicts, that doesn't necessarily mean that your babies are more likely to survive. So this is contrary to my hypothesis, and it's contrary to expectations, because it seems pretty intuitive, right, that somebody who is more powerful should probably and has better access to resources that their kids would do better, and they would have higher fitness. But this is what I love about science. You, uh, you get sometimes you get these surprising results. And when you get these surprising results, it's like a really cool puzzle. And now, so I've got this thing that's not expected. I've got these data, and I'm sh it's showing something I don't expect. So now I get to go like a detective and try to figure out why in the world did I not find the expected result? Was there something wrong with my hypothesis? Is there, did I, um, is there something about the way I analyzed the data? Maybe I need to look around and try different explanations, try to figure out what is going on. And this is what's exciting about science. If you love puzzles, and I love puzzles, if you love puzzles, science is a great career for you. So, um, but remember, Shifak are um, what's called female dominant. And that means females rank above the males, and they basically get what they want. And that's why I actually started studying Shifa, because I was interested in the evolution of power between the sexes. And so um, there are some different hypotheses for why female dominance might evolve. And one of the hypotheses is that um, you're going to see female dominance arise whenever animals live in really harsh and unpredictable environments. Madagascar gets hit by a lot of cyclones, and that makes it a very unpredictable environment for females in terms of reproduction. They don't know whether food's going to be around or not because a cyclone might come and destroy their habitat. And so the hypothesis is that females need priority of access to resources when they live in these really unpredictable environments. And so how do they get the um, priority of access to those resources? The hypothesis is they mate with wimpy males. So um, the hypothesis is that females like deferential males and that females have dominance because females have mated with males who give them the good food. They go, oh, I don't need this food. You take it. You have it. I don't need it. That is the idea behind the male deference hypothesis, wimpy males. And so if this wimpy male hypothesis is true, then we might predict that males just give the food to females and they don't make much of a fuss about it when they give over the food, right? So let's look at some data. So this is submission rates here. This is how much the males are sub, um, submit, um, being submissive to the females. And the way a shifak male is, so, or way a shifak in general is submissive, they don't do this bow down like we, um, like we might do in human societies. They make something called a chatter. They go, 
And so what I can do is look and see when do males just go, chi, 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 you take the food. And when do they actually put up a fight? And so what you can see is males are not spontaneously giving up the food and going, chi, 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 you take the food, not very often. Most of the time, the reason males are submissive is because the females are beating them across the head. <laughs> so, so this example here, you know, I gave the example of baobab fruits, a classic example in my mind of what's really going on in Shifak societies. You see with the baobab fruits where the males will be working on those fruits for maybe even half an hour trying really hard to break through that hard shell. And when they finally do, the female comes along and cuffs them, and they hold on, and they just chatter, T -t 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 -t, and the female's cuffing them and hitting them and going, no, give me this fruit, and they don't want to let go. And eventually they may, or sometimes they even keep holding on to this fruit and chattering while the female's eating it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so in my mind, that just really goes against this hypothesis of wimpy males who just give up the food willingly to females, right? So this hypothesis just isn't supported by the data. But there's another problem with this hypothesis. I don't know if you picked up on the wording of this hypothesis. This hypothesis phrases it as if the males had the power in the first place. And so it's been seen as an evolutionary puzzle. Why in the world would the males give up their power to females? And so if you'll recall, I showed you this figure earlier, females are actually larger than males. And so why would we expect smaller males to be more powerful than the females? And another question is, did males actually have the power in the first place? And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to look and see what did the last common ancestor of primates look like? Did the last common ancestor of primates, were they male dominant? And so what I did is I teamed up with some paleontologists and we took advantage of some tools that paleontologists used to try to reconstruct what was going on with their fossils. And so the way you do that is you look at a trait across all these living primates and then from that, you can reconstruct what that ancestral primate probably looked like. And so we did that with dominance and power. We looked to see what did the last common ancestor of primates look like. Well, no, the last common ancestor of primates was not necessarily male dominant. Our results showed that actually there's a 50% chance that the last common ancestor of of all primates was male dominant, and the 50% chance that the last common ancestor of all primates was female dominant. And male dominance as, um, as a consistent sort of um, behavior or system doesn't really um, come about until the last common ancestor of monkeys and apes. And actually, we found that, that uh, male dominance is not necessarily typical of primates in general. So, <coughs> This hypothesis is wrong. <laughs> the male dom the female dominance does not evolve, did not evolve because females selected for wimpy males who just willingly give up their, um, the resources to the females. So a second hypothesis you can kind of get from what I've been talking about, and that's that maybe body size influences dominance. Maybe females dominate males whenever females are larger than males because females have superior fighting ability. So in some species of primates, like these gibbons here, males and females are the same size. In other species, like these potus monkeys and the mandrills, males are much larger than females. And in other species, like the injury here, females are larger than males. So according to this hypothesis, we would predict that in these species where the males are larger, males are dominant. In this species where the female's larger, the female's dominant. And when males and females are the same size, we expect to see something called co-dominance, where males and females are social equals. So what we did is we decided to test this hypothesis, and we plotted the um, ratio of male and female body size on, the, uh, on this axis here for each species of primates according to whether they're female dominant co-dominant or male dominant. And this dotted line here indicates where males and females are the same size. Anything above the line, males are larger than females. 
Anything below the line, females are larger than males. And you can see that, especially when we look over here at male dominance, there does seem to be a, a relationship between body size and dominance. Male dominant species um, are generally, males are much larger than females when you see male dominance. But the opposite is not true. So here you have your female dominant species, and you can have some species, the males are slightly larger than the females, and females still dominate them. And if you look over here at co-dominance, there are some species where males are 30% larger than the females, and yet males and females are social equals. Or sometimes females are larger than the males, and yet they're social equals. And so, <clears throat> This hypothesis doesn't work either. The data just don't support this hypothesis. So a third hypothesis is based upon some of the work that I've done about uh, power in general that incorporates ideas about um, economic theory or economic ideas into our understanding of power in animal societies. And this hypothesis says that maybe female dominance evolves when females have leverage over males and the idea is, because think about it, in mammals, females control reproduction. Conception, gestation, and lactation all occur within the context of female physiology. And so this may be a source of power for females. And so um, males cannot reproduce without um, access to this mating opportunity. And so the supply, and they need to be able to reproduce to increase their fitness. And so the supply and demand of males and females can influence power. So in some situations where you have a lot of females and a few males, then the supply of mating opportunities is high and females aren't going to have a lot of power in this situation. But in other cases, where there are not many, when there's only one or two females who are ready to mate, or maybe there's a lot of males around, then females are going, the supply is low and the demand is high, and females are expected to have more power. So there are many ways to test this idea about economic power in lemurs. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk to you about one particular test to see if female power in Shifak is economic power. And it takes advantage of the fact that there's a period of adolescence in Shifak. The teenage stage is when the females are about three or four years of age. And at this time, they can be sexually active, but they don't uh, generally give birth. Or if they do, those infants generally don't survive. And it's not until the females are about five years of age when they become reproductively mature. And we consider them adults because they reliably produce offspring at this time. So we can take advantage of this with Shifak, and we can test the prediction that if female power in Shifak is leveraged, then female age is expected to determine the pattern of submission. And only females who reliably produce offspring, reliably produce offspring only these females are going to receive submission from the males. And so this figure shows you those teenage females and those adult females. This is male submission to females. And you can see that the, the males are not very submissive to these teenage females. And it's only once females are able to reliably produce offspring that you see males starting to be submissive towards them. We can look at the reverse. We can look at female submission to males. And you can see these teenage females are more submissive towards the males than the, dom than the adult females. And we can actually then even look at the same female as she changes from one stage to another and see what that looks like. So here we have three females, Hester, Keita, and Rose. And this is female submission to males. Again, the blue is the teenage females. And you can see that the teenage females are much more submissive towards the males. But once mating is likely to result in an offspring, then you see here where the, in the red circles, then the social dynamics between males and females fundamentally changes. So um, my data, um, be, my behavioral data, don't really support the male deference or the body size hypothesis. They're consistent with, uh, more consistent with the hypothesis that females have leverage. So, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you just a little bit about conservation. Nearly all lemurs are endangered. 
and only about 10% of the forest is left in Madagascar. The situation is really dire. Habitat is being lost due to forest fires. Um, it's being lost due to logging and um, charcoal production. And um, one of the things to keep in mind, though, is that the situation is pretty dire for the people as well. Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world, and I work in one of the poorest areas of Madagascar. And so um, where I work, the people live in um, these kinds of houses, and they don't have electricity or running water. So this charcoal production, while it is terrible for the lemurs, it's really important because that's how they cook their food. And that's how they boil their water so that it's safe to drink. And then they need the wood in the forest to be able to build these houses, to build their ox carts. They need the wood to be able to build boats. This area, um, a lot of the people make their livelihood based upon just fishing. What they do is they fish and they bring their food home for their family that evening. And this, this is actually a tree that was illegally logged um, from uh, the forest. And, um, and I found it in that fishing village just a few days later. And these trees, to be able to make these boats, which are so important for um, their livelihood, they have to cut down for these dugout canoes, they have to cut down trees that are like this. They're really big. And you know how important these really big trees are because the lemurs have to sleep in these big trees to make sure they don't get eaten by the flusa. So conservation is a really difficult situation in a place like Madagascar because it's, um, it, the livelihood is very difficult for the animals as well as the people. And we need to make sure that everybody can um, continue to survive well. But a bright spot um, in conservation is actually the Nkua Shivaka Research Station. We've had a huge impact on conservation, partly because we have a permanent presence in the forest. People are in the forest day in and day out. And so not only are we able to monitor activities in the forest, but people don't bother doing the illegal activity in that area because they know we're going to be there. And the other thing is we get researchers from all over the world. They're Malagasy researchers, researchers from here at UT and the US, but from all over the world. And this brings a lot of money into the area. And I'm actually one of the largest employers in this area. And because of that, the people have, uh, really value the forest intact as an intact ecosystem because they know that this is what brings money into the area. And so research is actually finding that one of, most, one of the most effective ways to protect and conserve a, a habitat is actually to have a long-term research station there. So if you're interested in conservation, basic science, field biology, is actually a really important component of that. But let me summarize what I want you to get out of this talk, what I hope you got. First, I hope you got lemurs are cool, and it's really important that we conserve them. Second, science is a whole lot of fun. I think I feel so lucky that I get to do this every day. Research is a team support, is a team sport. I could not do what I do without a whole group of people working with me in this endeavor. When you're thinking about evolution, babies are important because that is how um, fitness, that's how genes get passed on. And finally, power is more than fighting. While fighting ability is really important for understanding power, there are other sources of power. Knowledge is a source of power, and tolerance can be a source of power as well. Thank you very much, and as we say in Madagascar, Misochobetsuka, and if you want to find more about my research um, or Nkua Shifak, here is the website. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. So once again, welcome to Hot Science Cool Talks. Our talk tonight featured anthropology professor Rebecca Lewis talking about friendship and female power in the lemurs of Madagascar. And so now we're going to chat with Dr. Lewis and answer questions from the audience. And if we advance it one, we'll oh. put the uh, Slido website up and how to, uh, how to send in your questions. So pull out your phones and get on this app and we'll now have questions for Dr. Lewis. So. I'll take the first question, Rebecca. All right. So as a lemur layperson myself, mm -hmm. I consider myself a lemur layperson. <laughs> I have to say lemurs are really cool and probably amongst the most fascinating creatures on the planet. 
But for you, after 23 years of working with them, does it still maintain its fascination or does it get old? Oh, you know, that's a great question uh, because sometimes uh, someone will come visit me and they're like, what? These guys don't do anything. They just sit there. They're really boring. They're just eating leaves all day. How can you watch them all day and not get bored? But they're always doing something that makes me laugh. And uh, they're always, I get these results that I'm not expecting is one thing. So I'm always having to figure out why in the world are they doing this unexpected thing. But they do really goofy things. Like they, they, they <laughs> there's one time where there was a, a kid who was holding on to a little sapling and an ma adult male jumped on it and the tree bent all the way down to the ground. And you can guess what's going to happen next, right? That male jumped away and the, the kid was holding on for dear life, trying not to be flung off. So the they're always doing these really exciting, funny things that just make me laugh. And then, as I said, they're, um, I keep finding they, they just don't fit our expectations because a lot of our hypotheses have been developed based upon monkeys and apes. And so, as I said earlier, lemurs are a great independent radiation, an independent group of primates to be able to test hypotheses. And when they don't fit our expectations, then that's really interesting. Thank you. A uh, question from the audience is, do lemurs who are habituated act differently from those who are not? How do you think about or study that difference? That's a great question. It would be really hard to study how different they are because you can't watch them without being there. I guess you could put some sort of a lemur cam on them or something like that and try to see. But one of the things that we do is we look and see, uh, you collect data, and you look and see when um, you're collecting data on them, when they're, um, so there might be, like uh, when you follow them, they might be moving around a lot. And eventually, they, you look for a period where the, the, the graph kind of levels off and where their uh, behavior starts to stabilize. And that's when you know that they're used to you. Um, and you hope that that's as close to normal as possible. We in science strive for objectivity. But objectivity is, an, is really truly achievable. So you try not to influence your subjects. But there are times when you do. And um, there was one time, I remember I was a graduate student. And I was out there, I was watching Shifak, and um, all of a sudden, all uh, the whole group jumped on this one male, and they were pinning him down, and they were attacking him. And I heard this really loud noise, and I was like, what is this noise? And then I realized it was me. I was screaming. <laughs> I was supposed to be objective, but it was so disturbing, I realized that I was reacting to what I saw. But the lemurs, they didn't even, they were too busy with their own thing, and now I'm better at controlling my emotions with it. But what happened then was the lemur who was being attacked used me as an observer. And he got away, and he jumped, he could have jumped in any direction, but he jumped right over my head, so close my hair was like flying, floating in the wind. He went right over my head. Presumably, I can only guess, but presumably trying to use me as a deterrent so that the other lemurs, he could have a little bit extra time to get away. But that didn't stop the other lemurs. They went past me, and then they're hopping down the trail, and I'm running after them trying to keep up with them. But they do, um, you try not to influence them, but um, surely your presence does affect it. One major way that it does affect it is if the predators are not habituated, then you reduce the risk of predation. And so, luckily or not, I don't know how you want to think about it, the predators at my site, the FUSA, are very habituated to me, and they hunt all around me. So I'm not deterring that, but in um, some places you have to be very careful. Neat. Yeah. This question starts out with that hopping. <laughs> what are their joints and spines like? Oh. <laughs> oh, we have an expert in the audience here, Liza Shapira. That hopping. What are, their, what are their joints and spines like to deal with all that hopping? I could give a whole lecture on that. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm sorry. Like they have spines like apes. That's how they deal with it. Because they're upright. Cause, yes, because they're, they're upright. Um, like apes are upright as opposed to the quadrupedal on their hands and, knee, uh, hands and feet. That's the best I can do. I'm sorry. Good, good. So <laughs> next question is, have you ever missed catching a safaka in the bedsheet? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> it's really hard because the sedative doesn't act immediately. So the dart goes in, 
And then there's about 60 seconds before the, um, the medication actually goes into effect. And luckily, most of the time, they just go, whoa, what just happened? And they don't move because they're scared. Or they just move a little bit. But sometimes they move really fast into an area of the forest that's difficult to get them. And we, uh, my team is really great. They're really experienced, and they've been capturing them for years. And Anafa, as I said, is really experienced as a darter. And so um, I would say 99% of the time, we are able to get under there. But there, once in a blue moon, you can't. It's always a risk to, um, to capture animals. And this is why when I do it, I try to collect as much data as possible. And I try to do things like program the radio collar so that the battery lasts for years so I don't have to capture them very much, uh, very often, to try to reduce the risk to animals. But we work really hard to make sure that they are safe. And, um, and, and we um, almost always capture them, catch them when they fall. OK. Now there are several questions along this theme, so let me read a couple of them. Right. Are there programs for teachers to go to Madagascar and help with lemur researchers? <laughs> Do you need a field assistant? Can I go with you? <laughs> I would love to say yes to everybody. Um, no, it would be great. Actually, um, I've been working with the park service in the area, and um, the park is opening up right next to the field station, is opening up for ecotourism. And we've been working with the park and with local guides, trying to train them to to understand um, a lot of the information, build upon what we've learned from research. Um, I, uh, when I can, I do look for assistance and I do take um, volunteers sometimes. I, I haven't taken so many um, until recently because I haven't had a well and the water has, comes by ox cart every two or three days. And it's a little bit risky to have volunteers come when there isn't a permanent water source. But I'm happy to actually announce that UT is contributing and actually buying me a well this year. And so I am hoping to actually start a field school at the site, because um, now that water will be reliable, I'm hoping to start a field school for um, undergraduates to come to the site. And if you're interested in being assistant, you can go ahead and contact me. We'll see. <laughs> it's, not, it's not cheap to go to Madagascar. It is halfway around the world. So that's, that's something that, that people run into. OK. So Emmy asks this question. Um, do you help the sick lemurs that you find? Oh, that's a great question. Because what do you do? So I have them down, and I'm counting the ticks and lice. Do I remove the ticks and lice? Because they're doing me a favor. I've captured them, and the least I could do is help them out. But then if I remove the ticks and lice, then I affect their behavior because maybe they don't groom as much because they, don't, they aren't as itchy. They don't have as many ectoparasites. And so this is always a dilemma because I want to help the lemurs out, but then I'm also influencing the data if I do that. And so um, it depends on what the project is. Um, when Fidi, the vet, was there, you know, he often would do things to um, help them out with their health a little bit. And we just made sure that um, we didn't follow the lemurs that um, were affected in that way for a while and took note of, um, of those changes. But it's hard because sometimes, you know, as I said, those, the FUSA will hunt with me standing right there. And so if you see a FUSA hunting a lemur, what do you, you know, do you stop it? You know, it's a really, this is, a, um, this is one of those things about ethics that we as a field grapple with and try to figure out what is the right thing to do. And um, for myself, I tend to try to keep things as um, they would be as if I were not interfering. And I try, it's really hard, like I told you I was screaming that one time, I try really hard not to um, interfere with the lemurs' lives any more than I already do by being um, present there. Okay. Next question is, uh, did you encounter dangerous animals while in the field and what was the protocol? <laughs> You know, this is one of the wonderful things about working in Madagascar. You don't have to worry about dangerous animals. The FUSA is about the size of a medium-sized dog. So I don't really have to worry. I mean, it could hurt me, but I don't have to worry about my life. And um, there, um, there, there are poisonous snakes in Madagascar, but they all have rear-facing fangs. So in order to actually get exposed to the toxins of the, the, the snakes, I'd have to shove my fist down the throat of a snake and then pull it back. And so I'm not going to do that. So one of the nice things about working in Madagascar is I can sit on the ground. I can, I can even lay down on the ground and take a siesta if I want. I don't have to worry about... Um, 
about um, uh, my safety because of wild animals. Whereas some people work in areas where there are jaguars or lions. The, the, with the lorises, there are a number of lorises that we actually don't really know much about their social behavior. I keep asking them, are they male dominant? Are they female dominant? What are the social relationships like? And the, the researchers tell me, you go out there and watch them at night with lions and elephants and mambas and we don't know some behavior about some species because it's dangerous but in Madagascar it's nice and safe. Speaking of watching them at night, how, how do you do that? A headlamp. <laughs> a headlamp and a good mag light. Um, but um, actually um, I'm, I'm gonna try, I just got a grant and we need to be able to collect um, the, the, year, the first urine of the morning and during the rainy season they actually are active a couple of hours before the sun comes up and so I put in my grant infrared binoculars so I'm really excited to try them out to see if this will let us watch them at night but usually you have to you have to use a headlamp and, um, and a mag light and um, do your best to keep radio collars are really important for nocturnal work because you're likely to lose them so, Dr. Lewis, some of your research centers around uh, looking at color blindness amongst the sheep flock and how that relates to fitness of the offspring. You, you didn't have a chance to talk about that today. Would you like to share a bit about that? Yeah, so um, there is a postdoc at UT, Carrie Veyu, and she's really interested in sensory ecology. And um, she uh, and I were talking, and Chris Kirk, who's a sensory ecologist in the anthropology department as well, a number of us were talking about um, some of the hypotheses about why um, color vision, the kind of color vision that, that we human, that most humans have, it's called routine trichromacy. We can see the distinguish between red and greens. And why this evolved, because it's not present in a, um, a number of primates. And there are various hypotheses about why you would want to be able to distinguish red from greens. Or why you might not want to. Why you might want to be what we call colorblind. Um, and so, um, for humans anyway. And so, what we did is... Um, I was like, hey, you know, I actually have genetic, I have those genetic samples. And so we can look and see um, who has a color vision, trichromacy, and who does not. And one of the things that we found, because it's actually linked, um, it's on the X chromosome. And actually, color vision is a really interesting phenomenon and in that it's a case where you've got a really nice relationship between the gene and coding for a protein, and that protein... Um, Really, um, what it does is um, it, it really affects the um, ability to absorb particular frequencies of light. And so if um, um, it's associated with the X chromosome, and so males only have one X chromosome, and so they, um, they, can, uh, they can only see a particular frequency of, um, a range of frequency of light. Uh, but the females have two X chromosomes, and if they have slightly different um, alleles on that X chromosome, then they actually can see a wider range of colors, and they're able to have uh, distinguish red from green. And so we looked to see which, which females could, um, were trichromatic, had color vision, and then we could also do something, we could look at the, this, um, this, uh, the fitness, we could look at reproductive success. Do females that can distinguish red from green, do they have more babies, and do those babies survive? And the answer is no. And we look to see, what about what foods do they eat? Because I collect data on the foods that they eat. We could look and see, do they eat foods that are, um, do some females, the females who can distinguish red from green, do they eat different foods? We really didn't see much difference. But actually what we found is that the males really benefit from being in a group with a female who can distinguish, uh, who, um, who can see the three different colors. And so we were able to take advantage of this long-term data set and ask a question retroactively and say, hey, can we, uh, can we figure out why um, color vision evolved? And we're actually one of the first who've been able to show this kind of information with, um, with any sort of um, mammal, I believe, um, animal, mammal. I'm looking at Chris Kirk, who, uh, <laughs> who is our sensory ecologist. And Chris is looking back. He's looking back. He's not answering. <laughs> so the ne next question comes from Laura Robin at Minor. Okay. She asks, how do females interact with one another? Do they form friendships or altruistic relationships with one another? Or do they compete with, do they compete with males for territory? 
So females and males live in a social group together. You can, um, and so the females stay in their natal group, most of them, and males always disperse to a different group. Once they become a teenager, they'll move to, an, they'll start visiting other groups, figuring out, do I want to go to this group? Do I want to go to that group? And eventually they'll disperse to a different group. And then they'll um, uh, become an adult and stay in that group for a while, and then they'll disperse again. They disperse every three years or so. Females stay in their natal group, and that means that they get to live with their female relatives. But groups are really small, so sometimes females have to leave their group as well. And so you would expect that if females are hanging out with their relatives, their daughters, their aunts, their mothers, their grandmothers, that they would have a really tight social relationships. But actually what we found, this is another thing, she found just, this is what I love about Chifog. I, I didn't think I'd be spending my whole life studying them, but they just, they just don't do what we expect. You would expect the females to be good friends with each other, but they don't actually hang out together that much. They sleep together in little sleep balls a lot. But then what tends to happen is if both females have babies, then uh, the low-ranking female tends to kind of peel off and hang out more on the periphery of the group so that she can actually have access to food because the dominant female will keep her from, uh, will prevent her from feeding in the tree with her. And, um, and so we've been trying to figure out why in the world you have this system because you saw in that data that female rank doesn't really influence infant survival. We actually couldn't find any benefit to being dominant. And so I don't really understand what's going on. Why are the females not hanging out together? And um, so I'm actually looking for a graduate student who wants to study this question, if anybody's out there. Um, um, so yeah, they're, they can be friendly, and they can hang out together. But um, the, the dominant female treats her like anybody else and will take the food away and hit her on the head and stuff like that. Well, that's a good segue into our next question. If I want to be a primatologist, what would I major in for undergraduate school? Great question. So, um, primatology, to be a primatologist, you can study primatology in anthropology, like I do, like I am an anthropologist. You can study primatology in biology, and you can study primatology in psychology. There are um, different approaches for each of the, the, the fields, but all of them will um, um, give you a good background. Um, but I would say biological anthropology or biology, if you're interested in field primatology, if you're interested in captive primatology, then psychology is good as well. But I would also say that one of the things you should do is take a lot of math um, and computer programming. I didn't realize, you know, when I first started out, <laughs> it was, statistics were very different. And a lot of what we do now involves a lot of computer programming and sophisticated math. So regardless of what you major in, you want to make sure you have good math and good programming or coding skills. This question comes from Jolie. She asks, how do you pick the lemurs' names? <laughs> so, um, how do I pick the names? Well, we take turns because I like to choose some names and the uh, Malagasy who work with me think they're terrible names. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, this she fox white, and so I'll name it rice because rice is white. And so the word in Malagasy for rice is vardi, and I'll be like, hey, let's call this one vardi, and they're like, you want to call it rice? <laughs> or I'm like, hey, salt is white, and so let's name it sira, and they're like, you want to call it salt? And so we take turns who gets to name the, the lemurs. Um, sometimes I get to name, sometimes we just rotate through the different people who work at the site. Um, and that's a, that way nobody gets too upset about these. But one of the things is you don't want to name a lemur after somebody who you're really close to. Like I don't have a shifak named Becca, and I don't have a shifak, um, there's not a shifak named David, which is my son's name. Because you want to make sure that you don't form, an, you don't have um, attachment to the, the animal in a way and attribute characteristics to an animal that isn't there. It's just based upon your own experiences. So you want to try to choose names that, um, that have, um, that you have a uh, little connection to. And different people do it differently. Um, uh, so I do it where the female, uh, you know, female Savannah, she has all of her kids have names that start with S. Um, the site where I did my, um, or, you know, um, uh, Rose, all her kids start with R. With the site where I did my dissertation work, each group was a country, and all of the lemurs were named for a city in the country. But, um, 
The guy who was there one time, who ran that site one time, he, I guess he didn't have an atlas with him and he couldn't think of a, a Japanese city and so he named a lemur sushi. And sure, <laughs> sure enough, two weeks later, sushi got eaten. <laughs> and so I didn't go with that system. I went with using regular names. But in other sites, that site where I told you about um, the case where that lemur was being attacked by the group members and he jumped past me, at that site, they actually give lemurs numbers. They don't give them names. But to me, you know, that was mail 294. And that just to me seems like a prisoner's name. I, I, so I do, I do names, um, and we just choose it, whatever people want. OK, great. So this will be the last question. I have to say there is just countless questions here. We can't get to them all. But after this last question, uh, Dr. Lewis and will raffle off some of the prizes. I'm sure Dr. Lewis will be happy to stick around and answer mm -hmm. some more of your questions. But this last question comes from Caterline. And it's one of the most well-liked of all the questions asked. <laughs> when you were in elementary school, what did you think you wanted to be? Oh, you know, I am unusual in this situation. I've known I wanted to be a primatologist since I was eight years old. I, um, I watched a lot of National Geographic's, and this was the 1970s. And so uh, National Geographic had Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, Baruti Galtikas, a lot of women primatologists on TV, and I thought, this is what I want to do. I thought I wanted to study apes, because they looked so much like us. I thought, ah, oh, I really see humans in these primates. And so I wanted to be a primatologist, and I thought I'd study orangutans. Yeah. Um, and I got, well, I read uh, Born Free, and I thought, well, maybe I switched for a little while, and I thought maybe I would study um, the big cats. But, um, and I got sidetracked for a little bit. I thought maybe I'll go into politics or law in, um, in, in high school, because I thought, you know what? I could probably do this better than what the politicians are doing. So I thought I'll go into politics. But ultimately, what I ended up deciding to do was to study the politics of non-human primates instead. But I had a lot of support from my family to be able to, they encouraged me to, to follow my interest in animal behavior and primatology from a very young age. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Rebecca Lewis. Thank you, Thank you very much. This is for you. <laughs>